Monday. This is Think Tech Hawaii, and we're talking about Asia in Review um, with Chris McNally, Associate Professor of Political Economy at Chaminade, uh, and a, if you read my handwriting, a, uh, a fellow, a senior fellow at East West Center. So, yeah, adjunct senior fellow, yeah. Adjunct senior fellow. To me, you'll always be a senior fellow. Okay. Thank you. That's Chris. <laughs> Say hello to the people, Chris. Hello. <laughs> uh, who actually got me involved in China in the first place. The short story is I was invited uh, to the uh, Bank of Hawaii uh, in, I think it was 2002 or three, and Chris was giving a talk here downtown in their executive dining room about the, the new capitalism in China, and I was unaware of that. Most people mm -hmm. were, at that time, unaware of that, and he made us all aware of it, and it changed my whole view. It, it woke me up about China, and not too long thereafter, I organized a trip of the directors. I was a chair at the, to the chair at the time of the High Tech Development Corporation, and I organized a um, on, on your own trip by the directors of the High Tech Development Corporation to go to China and see the tech parks there. We had a marvelous eye-opening mm -hmm. trip, and I learned that uh, you know the, the great change, the, the delta factor, was the level of energy. As soon as you get off the plane. It strikes you like a wave, the energy that goes on. People welding on tall buildings at 3 o'clock in the morning, you know, it's that kind of a place. Um, sort of an arbitrage of energy, <laughs> human energy. Okay, we're calling this show The Great Rebalance. Uh, China's in, in international resurgence in the global economy. Uh, Chris gave it that name, but I like that name too. Huh. Well, thank you. So why do you say that? What what things have happened lately, uh, you know, to make us feel that there is a great rebalancing going on of China and its emergence in the global economy? What is happening that tip us off about this? In the first place, in a sense, this great rebalance has been a long time in the making. About 12 years ago, the Chinese already became aware that their model was quite loopsided, meaning that the economy was very dependent on exports, on increases in exports to the rest of the world, and on continued strong investment. First of all, real estate, but also infrastructure and industrial. And it was becoming clear that China would run into basically diminishing returns on its investment, especially on the industrial side. They were basically producing overcapacity, too much steel, too much cement, too much aluminum, too much housing as well and uh, that they just couldn't continue to export uh, in this manner. Now, they were able to sustain their export boom for quite some time, and it was really the financial crisis in 2008 with the collapse of Lehman Brothers when world trade basically collapsed. And although it really swung back in 2009, since then China's exports have nowhere been as dynamic, and indeed its trade surplus has diminished quite radically. It's basically, you know, more than half. Including on uh, the trade surplus they have with us. Uh, that one is actually still quite large. Mm -hmm. So it's really been a change in commodity prices, meaning that they have to import a lot more expensive steel and oil, and that has changed their trade surplus. Uh, but it also means that they continue to import a lot from their Asian neighbors, especially Korea, Japan, Taiwan, uh, most of which run a trade surplus. Korea and Taiwan both run a trade surplus with China. So with the United States, although our exports to China have been growing very rapidly, uh, there's still a very sizable trade deficit uh, because we continue to import a lot of things from China. And a lot of that has to do with the business models of American corporations so who use China as a manufacturing platform, the iPods, iPads, etc. But these are not easy to manufacture, so you have to give them credit for fine tolerances and, and great practices in manufacturing. Yeah, not only that, for just absolutely phenomenal means of shifting even manufacturing to cheaper locales. So I was just back in June in Chengdu, and we looked at this Foxconn factory that's the, uh, most of the iPads are now being produced there as well as some iPhones. And they basically scaled this place up within 18 months from 10,000 employees to 150,000 employees. So the, the speed with which you can move things in China has a lot to do with you know, how land, approvals, et cetera, is handled still quite incredible. So uh, China's going to remain a very sizable exporter. It's the biggest trading power now this year, last year. Uh, it became the biggest trader in the global system, overtaking the United States. But 
even the even despite the fact that China will remain so important in global trade, you have a situation where they cannot rely on exports to drive their internal domestic growth. There's just not enough external demand, demand in the United States, Europe, and the rest of the world to absorb kind of the added capacity that China is putting online. So that's why Hu Jintao, at the end of his term, was focused in the last year or so of his term was focused on building the domestic market. Yeah, and actually, Hu Jintao has been talking about it since he came to power. And a lot of Chinese fault the administration of Hu Jintao and Wen Jiabao for having talked about it, but done nothing. So now it's up to this new administration that came in earlier this year, uh, late last year, to basically do the hard stuff. Uh, they did some of the easy stuff, and the Hu Jintao and Wen Jiabao, but the really difficult things involve domestic reforms that include things, for example, like strong urbanization. That is really the main plank. So, that, so the Chinese would like to move away from exports and especially investments in heavy industry to investment in urbanization and thereby then creating a consumption class, a middle class that can consume and drive the economy internally. This is not easy. It's not easy at all. And it includes things like the railroad that they're building? The railroads are very much part of this because it means that cities that were kind of in the boondogs, out in nowhere, uh, can be connected to a major city, you know, like one hour away. I mean, originally you would have had to drive three and a half hours by car. Uh, and now you can hop on a high-speed train and you end the provincial capital in an hour or less. And then maybe you hop on another train and you can get to Beijing in two hours or to Shanghai in two hours. So y you can really kind of shrink distances, move the country together, and make second and especially third-tier cities more interesting for people to move to. Because a lot of people are talking about the China's real estate boom, which is kind of seen as a potential downfall for the system. And I know we'll talk later about kind of, you know, what do you call the overheating process, yeah. And a lot of that is happening actually not in the major cities. I mean, you build something in Shanghai, even far out, it's going to be taken up. You build something in Beijing. Uh, I, again, I was in Chengdu, I talked to somebody in the real estate sector, and they said, whatever they build, it gets snapped up before it's even finished. Well, that's the thing. It goes so, back to my point about energy, and it goes back to the trip I was telling mm -hmm. you about. So we went to uh, some entrepreneur, you know, young companies in the Tianjin uh, uh, Tech Park. Mm -hmm. And somebody said, well, you know, how long does it take you to design and manufacture a widget, you know, per the specs of an American company? And the guy said, well, a week, we can do it. And then somebody says, well, we, we might like to cut a deal with you. Let's like come in and take part of the park here and have our little um, American business within the Tinchin Tech Park. How long would that take? Oh, tomorrow. I mean, it, it's, it seems to me that things move very fast. Did and it, it probably wasn't tomorrow. It was probably the day after tomorrow, but it was right there in that possibility. So people, as a people thing, it's easy to understand why China has been so successful, because they have this mindset of doing things. And Although there's also drawbacks. I mean, a lot of Chinese would fault their system for being too fast <laughs> and yeah. doing things slightly sloppy and, okay. you know, the, yeah. and everything being also very short profit cycles, you know, not really long-term investments in human capital. This is especially for private companies or in R&D, you know, very much kind of, you know, let, let's flip something and make money out of it. Now, every system of capitalism has this. Uh, so there's the United States. But what I'm trying to say is that you've got big cities, even in the center of the country, where, yes, you have a real estate boom, but it's probably sustainable. Uh, you have a lot of second, third tier cities that have overbuilt. Uh, and real estate might have been bought, but people don't live there. And overall, they're not very sustainable. Because if they don't get a certain amount of population, then the service sector will not take off. They cannot build up a healthy urban area. So and so the high speed balance. There's a real imbalance. Uh, and so the high speed rail is part of uh, what they're trying to do to address this. And then the other, one of the other planks is basically stopping the registration system. So this is something that's being discussed, which is basically an internal kind of passport system where it's very difficult for people to migrate from one place to another. And uh, there's big resistance, especially in the bigger cities, by the people who already live there, because they don't want all the farmers coming in. And I was in Shanghai, uh, very close to Xintiandi. This is the super posh area. Yeah. And there was this farmer family, and the little boy had to go. And so they just took down his pants and just let him poo-poo right in the middle of the park. And uh, again, that's the so kind of... It's not a good thing. No, it's not, a, you know, and, and, and so you do have these incredible 
kind of internal differences, uh, not only economic differences, but in many ways cultural differences, behavioral patterns, even uh, in terms of people's kind of, you know, the way they think, re real social economic differences. Uh, that uh, are causing animosities. That means you have this established kind of middle class in Shanghai. They don't want any of the outsiders coming in. The same thing in Beijing, the same thing. Although Guangzhou in the south already has, has been inundated by outsiders, so there's really not that well, many but natives but left. Assuming they did not oppose that, they did not mm. object to that, wouldn't there be a negative effect of having everybody rush to the big cities? Oh, yes. Leave the oh. farm behind, that kind of thing? Yeah, in, in China, Again, that's another side of this transition. It is to manage the transition in the countryside, where you've got a lot of young people moving out. So if you only old people farm, you might have farmland that doesn't get tilled. So the idea is to create bigger and bigger farms and ultimately industrialize agriculture. Is that happening? Uh, it is happening, yes. It is happening. So that is a big part of what is going on as well. So the country is coming together. I mean, is, is that the net effect of all this? That, um, yes, there are imbalances. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's not perfect, uh, but in, in many ways this is a unification of the countryside and the big cities. It's a, it's a bringing together of the whole country by way of the rail, uh, by way of um, the fact that industry is, is finding a place everywhere and there are no pockets of big poverty or ruralness that are not included in the change. No? There's still pockets of poverty, there's still big pockets of ruralness, and this is a transition that's ongoing. But yes, at the end of this transition, the idea is, is to move from a society that's roughly about 50-55% urbanized to 75% urbanized. That means bringing about 250 million, 300 million people from the countryside into the cities. And ultimately, it probably will mean that a lot of people will move from third-tier cities to second- and first-tier cities, so you're going to get much bigger mega cities. I mean, Shanghai, official, it's about 20 million inhabitants. Unofficial, some people have told me 30 million at least, some even say 40 million, which would make it the biggest city in the world. Chongqing so, is what, 30 million? Or, although that is very deceptive, because Shanghai, the city of Shanghai, the territorial unit is really becoming fully urbanized, yeah. whereas Chongqing is a very large area, yeah. much of which remains uh, rural. So yeah. it, it's, it's, it's more a province than a city uh, comparatively speaking. But isn't this migration that you describe mm. which is happening now, isn't that, doesn't that bode well for the economy of China in general? It does bode well for the economy of China, but there is this transition going on, and there's other major issues such as you have an investment overhang. You've invested too much in cement plants, aluminum smelters, steel plants, uh, maybe at some point even car production. They're investing like mad in car plants, but that is being taken up. Car sales are doing actually quite well. but. And you have a big overinvestment in real estate and some urban infrastructure, especially in these third, fourth tier, second tier cities. So the question is, can they manage to lower growth, to restrict lending, especially to speculative activities and activities that will not create big returns, and at the same time have domestic consumption and urbanization take over as a motor of growth? This is really kind of a balance in act. We that's worried about overheating now. No, not overheating. I mean, we should be worried about the economy falling off the cliff because, <laughs> okay, <so that's> different. <laughs> because you might have a credit crunch. Uh, you might have a situation where people get scared of lending out money, uh, and although unlikely because the government can always tell the banks to lend money, but uh, there, there's been, you know, the People's Bank of China, China's central bank, has engineered actually credit crunches, artificial to shock the banks and make them aware that if you are too much out on a limb with lending, uh, it's not a good idea. Uh, you might have a price to pay. And their stocks have dropped as a result. Small and medium-sized banks have really been hammered, their stocks in the last six months. Okay, so what are the but factors that make you feel um, that we, we are having, a, or we need to have a great rebalance between China and its, re, re, uh, uh, its place in the global economy? In this rebalance that the Chinese are trying to pull off domestically. They're affirmatively trying to do this. They're affirmatively this trying. Yeah. No, no, this, this is, is not an accident. No, no. National policy. This is national policy. The 12 5 year plan, which runs from 2011 to 2015, is absolutely adamantly clear about that. And there's been a whole host of other reforms. As I mentioned, this residential system, the Hukou system, there are debates about this. This is very much out there. I mean, this is something where there's actually quite a lot of transparency and where the government.
government is quite forthright in talking about a possible opposition from middle class Chinese in established cities. So this is very much out there. This has been, as I said, it's been talked about roughly since 2001. It really has started up probably in around 2010. Uh, and now the problem is it's just you have this huge investment overhang. Uh, there's been too much investment in a whole range of areas. And the question is, can they kind of, you know, stop credit from expanding, you know, continuing to expand so rapidly? Will they end up with huge amounts of non-performing loans, basically a financial crisis? Uh, can they stop that from happening while creating a new motor of growth at the same time? You know, so this, this is a tough one. But if they pull it off, it means that the world economy changes. Well, yeah. do you have to take affirmative steps to rebalance, um, you know, China's position, its uh, re, re, re emergence or its emergence in the global economy, or does it just happen naturally if you improve your own domestic economy? In other words, is part of the plan you describe uh, to make China a bigger player in the world stage, affirmatively, standing yeah. up, standing up, stand up China among all these nations and be the, at least the second economy, and maybe someday soon the first economy mm -hmm. in the world. Yeah, in many ways, uh, the policies of rebalancing have to do with three major issues that are very much at the top of Chinese leaders' thinking. And the first is just the survival of the Communist Party. So it means that you need to rebalance in order to make society happier, to create a healthy middle class, uh, and also to have an economic system that's much more domestically tied. And that's the second plank. The second plank is really to become less dependent on exports, less dependent on any demand outside of China. And the third one, ultimately, is that China itself then actually becomes a very large market, a very large importer, which will give it even more power economically than it enjoys at present. Uh, meaning it moves from being you know, dependent on the European market for its solar panels to becoming such a huge market, for example, for European wine, that it can go to the Europeans and say, if you stop our solar panels from coming in, uh, we'll slap tariffs on your wine. And, and, and we're going to see a lot more of this happening. Uh, some yeah. commentators, like in the Financial Times in London, have been saying this is very negative. You know, this is kind of, uh, we might leap into protectionism. Uh, but all countries have been doing this to some extent. The United States did a lot of that with Japan in the 80s. And you'll see the Chinese doing that a lot more, especially with big countries like the US, where, where you know, we, we might say, we're going to slap tariffs on your solar panels. And the Chinese come around and say, OK, we'll slap tariffs on. You know. And they have the power to do it. Now, you're, you're an economist through and through. I mean, political economist, economist, yeah. Okay, yeah. political economist. Okay, yeah. political economist. Whatever. <laughs> okay. And so, you know, what strikes me is that what's happening here in China, and it's been happening for a long time, is that there's been some very good management. There's some this great management. This didn't happen by accident. It's not serendipitous. Somebody called the shots on this. Somebody made a plan, and the plan worked well, is working well, right? True, but. Don't overstate kind of the wisdom, you know, the infinite wisdom of Chinese leaders. In some sense, you really do have to credit Deng Xiaoping. Because Deng Xiaoping came to the issue of reform, having seen what happened in the Maoist era, and himself suffered during the Cultural Revolution. And lots of the leaders did. But Deng Xiaoping, I kind of use him as the figurehead here of that whole cohort. And Maoist policies were all about mass mobilization, about having plans and just going for it without any checks and balances. Deng Xiaoping really moved away from that. It was much more experimental. And one of the, if you really want to look at the genius of what the Chinese did, it is yes, they have a plan, they have a vision. But then they basically do allow, in a sense, a hundred flowers to bloom, meaning like in our system, they allow a lot of decentralized experimentation. And we have, uh, the United States actually has been very successful for the same reasons, because we have states, and they experiment. And often they come up with very important policy solutions. So Obamacare is actually Massachusetts care. It's Romney care, so, which was really kind of the forerunner of the system. What the Chinese do really well, where we have to give them, is that they allow these experiments to flourish. They indeed even set them up. So the central government gives incentives for people to have these experiments. So the industrial parks you looked at, those tech parks, they are part of that. You know, Every place sets up a tech park. They experiment. How can we attract investors? And so then you get this idea, oh, you want to set up a company? We can get it done tomorrow. 
So because they know if, if they don't do it, the tech part, you know, the next province or the next city down will do it. So you have a lot of this competition, a lot of this kind of ferment of innovation on a policy level. But then when something quite successful happens, the central level is quite able to take it and scale it up and make it national policy. So they're looking for the successful experiments, yes. and then they pick up on that and, and take it to the next and level. Take it, and in the United States, one of our problems is, is we have a lot of very good, innovative experiments on the local level. But once you need to scale it up, it gets very, very difficult. Washington, D.C. has become very dysfunctional. It's actually very difficult to get anything done. Well, I want to talk to you about that right after this break. That, that's Chris McNally, mm -hmm. Associate Professor of Political Economy at Chaminade, and an adjunct uh, senior fellow at the East-West Center, and uh, his China is a big thing for him. We're talking Thanks. today about China, the Great Rebalance. We'll be right back after this break. Aloha, I'm Jay Fidel. I want to tell you about our program this month. We're doing a luncheon panel program at the Plaza Club with the Hawaii Venture Capital Association and ThinkTech about China. It's don't be afraid to send your kid or CEO to China. Stories of daring do and of life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness in the People's Republic. We want to introduce you to some people who have lived in China and show you that life in China is not so bad. It's not all about corruption and environmental degradation and lack of civil or human rights. It's not like that. And we want to have them tell you their day-to-day -day stories about how they've lived there. So our moderator is Larry Foster. He has taught uh, law in China, and he has taught, been practicing law in China for a firm in, uh, in Shanghai. His wife, Brenda Foster, is on the panel. Uh, she has been the president of the American Chamber of Commerce in Shanghai. We have Russell Liu. He's an attorney practicing with Shepard Mullen. Uh, in Beijing for quite some time. Shackley Ruffetto, a circuit court judge from Maui, who, uh, after retiring, went to China so he could teach judicial process there. And uh, Nikki Shishido, who has worked for DBED, the Department of Business, Economic Development and Tourism of the State of Hawaii, uh, in Beijing for some time. All these people have had the experience of living on the ground in China. We want to have them tell their stories to you. So maybe this will encourage you to send your kid or CEO to China. So if you're interested in this program, which ought to be very interesting, come down on August 22nd. You can sign up at hvca.org. I'm Jay Fidel. Mahalo. We'll see you there. Okay, we're back. We're live. We're here on Ustream. We're Think Tech doing Asia in Review uh, with Chris McNally, Associate Professor of Political Economy at Chaminade an adjunct senior fellow at the East-West Center. We're talking about China, the Great Rebalance. And the thing we left, you know, hanging uh, before the break, Chris, was the fact that uh, the U.S. maybe didn't have the same ability to scale up a good idea. And, uh, and that leads me to ask you, you know, so we have different systems. I mean, they're not going to be the same. Democracy is defined in different ways now these days. You know, there was a time when only the U.S. was a true democracy. That's not the case. Because what is a true democracy these days? So, so China has democratic elements. Maybe it has some non-democratic. You can't call it, you know, a pure communist country. In all that capitalism, you can't, you can't, you can never call it that. So the question is, what you know, what are the essential differences in as as interfaces with the economy, as interfaces with the two different brands of capitalism? In many ways, it is a bit comparing apples and oranges, but if we, let's say, we just compare the two different brands of capitalism, because, I mean, politically, we are light years apart. I mean, the systems are very different. I mean, there might be some ideas that we might be more similar than a lot of people have realized, especially in terms of, you know, eavesdropping on people, but um, there's still big differences. That'll be one of our discussions on the program, don't be afraid to send your kid as a CEO to China. <laughs> Trying to, try to really find out how, how threatening it is to be over there, you know, I don't think it's as threatening as it used to be. Anyway, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, there's, still, uh, there's eavesdropping everywhere, basically, yeah, right. nowadays. But in terms of two different brands of capitalism, I would say there's at least three major differences. The first difference, which kind of really flies in the face of a lot of the debates we have in the United States, is, is that the Chinese believe in markets, but only up to an extent. Basically, they believe in markets if their outcomes are to improve efficiency, to increase competitive pressures. But they use them 
as a means, not an end in and of itself. And the means is to develop the country, to build up productive capacity. So in areas where they distrust markets, especially finance, they have tightly regulated them. Uh, and in certain areas, indeed, there's even no market. There's still some price controls, and there's huge amounts of state-owned enterprises that don't work totally according to market criteria, especially if you would look at it from a US point of view. So there's a healthy, I would almost say, distrust of markets. Uh, one of the reasons is, is that if you do unleash markets in China and you don't regulate them, they basically become a casino. Uh, and Chinese have started to gamble on everything, from beans to garlic to uh, tea and uh, the Chinese government often has to come in at some point and clamp down uh, either put in uh, price controls or release stocks. Money trading that sort of thing? Uh, anything, anything, anything you put your hands on in China you will get a speculative element to it uh, and so there is a, a very large dose of government regulation uh, some of it can be very frustrating for people who do business uh, but in other areas it's actually quite healthy because it does keep from speculation from going overboard. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, that is kind of a, a first basic philosophical difference between the two systems. The second difference very much pertains to what should the state do. Uh, and in that sense, uh, I would actually argue that all of Eurasia, meaning all of Europe, Russia, India, Japan, China, Southeast Asia, are very similar and quite different from uh, the Anglo-Saxon countries. And that is that if anything goes wrong in society or the economy, people do look to the state for solutions. Whereas in the United States, often we would say, no, 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 get the, get the government out. You know, have more markets. Uh, that's very different. So the state is very much looked to to provide solutions, be it for social welfare, so health care. And, and it's also in many ways a very French or very German thing. So it's very European but as well. Were, that, were you the you guy that told me, I, I recall you, I think it was you who said this, that, is that in China, you know, basic cultural point is um, the government has an obligation to provide certain things to the people. And um, and to protect you, to make a state, to make a secure area, to make a decent economy, whatever government is required to do it. And the people reserve the right to throw the government over if it doesn't do that. Yeah, that is the mandate of heaven. But the or problem or with the mandate of heaven of has heaven. always been that if you're strong enough as a government to crush the rebellion, then you're right. So, uh, you know, <laughs> might makes right uh, was a very important part of the mandate of heaven and remains so. Uh, but uh, you're right that, uh, as in the US, there is now a lot more feedback into the political system. People are quite unhappy about things like food safety, medical care, and there's very strong pressures on the government to perform. But people are very clear that uh, if you want to reform health care, you need more government more regulation, public hospitals that are subsidized by the government. You need price controls on pharmaceuticals, and you need to get the pharmaceutical industries out of bribing doctors to give drugs and things like that. So It's very complicated, doesn't it's, it? it? I mean, and there are a lot of uh, contradictions in all of that. Uh, exactly what do you want the government to do, to be in, to be out, to take care of you, to leave you alone? And it's, it's, hard to, it's hard to find a clear thread there. But and and, and we, we may have a problem going forward in getting the government to actually do what has to be done. You mean in the United States? Yeah. Yes. Uh, philosophically, I think we have a problem that it, because it's not really about whether the government's big or small. It's about how it operates, how smart it is, and in certain areas, you need probably more government uh, or an ideally smarter government. Uh, but that is a big difference of our political system. We have the only parliament in the world that actually legislates. All other parliaments in the globe basically approve laws or disapprove them and criticize the government. But our Congress really legislates. And that means you have you know 430-something veto points in the House, another 100 veto points in the Senate. You get very complicated laws. Uh, in China, though, the philosophy is very different. It's very much one more, we want the government to be more effective, and people are much more willing to give up a certain degree of, let's say, privacy or, or even you know, interference in their lives. Indeed, the Chinese ha have had so much interference in their lives under Mao. I mean, everything was controlled from when you could marry, when you could have a child, where you could move, where you work, that the degree of freedom they enjoy now is actually already quite appreciated. So there is this you know, glass half full, half empty phenomenon. 
So the first is really distrust of markets. The second is the role of the state. Uh, and the third real difference in, in Chinese capitalism with the one of the United States is, is that you have this quite unique duality of, of, of you know, the state leads with very large companies. And I don't think that the largest state-owned enterprises will ever be fully privatized, at least not in the next decade or one and a half. But you have enormous entrepreneurship bottom up. Uh, and there's this really kind of entrepreneurial wave or waves, I would argue, in China. Increasingly so. Uh, they've been there for quite some time, and they're still there. You know, Some have argued that actually entrepreneurship has been crushed, that the state has become too powerful are, in last. Relatively speaking, there are fewer state-owned enterprises now than before. Yes. And in the last uh, several years, the state-owned enterprises haven't really decreased much in size and number. And there's debates now, because this, the state-owned enterprises are still there. Probably too many. Many of them are very inefficient. There's a lot of loss-making enterprises. Sectors where there are strong private enterprises, like real estate, uh, the state-owned enterprises tend to be the suckers. So when real estate prices went through the roof back in 2010, the most expensive parcels of land were bought by state-owned enterprises, at the, the private, top, at, the at the top of the market, yeah. Because the people in charge don't care that much about profits, yeah. you know. Yeah. So um, so th there are efficiency considerations. Uh, but there are areas like uh, the telecoms and especially energy, utilities, where uh, the state is very unlikely to retreat in any big way. Uh, there are well, many. It's sort of strategic industry. Yeah, strategic, yeah. But there's lots of state owned enterprises in things like still, you know, uh, retail and, and especially distribution systems. Those and, will probably uh, go away. And they probably will go away. I mean, this is, this is going to be part of the big rebalance. And there probably is going to be more private enterprise in the financial sector, but regulated. We've had private kind of, you know, quasi banks operating for quite some time, especially along China's coastal areas. Uh, but uh, the idea is to bring these more into the fold, uh, to formalize them and therefore then regulate them. So there's probably going to be some bigger influence in the private, you know, in the financial sector by private enterprise. Uh, but overall, uh, you still will have, you know, big state owned enterprise kind of leading these strategic areas. And nonetheless, you have this huge amount of private enterprise. And some of it has become very powerful, very sophisticated, quite large enterprises. And, and yet, you, you still have this kind of push and pull between the two forces. And in some sense, they become symbiotic. So it's, it's not, there is a lot of complaints from one side to the other. Uh, you know, state-owned enterprises saying private enterprises are not trustworthy. You know, their profit horizon is too short. They're too speculative. And, and the private enterprises saying the state enterprises are being bullies. They cry us, they've moved us out of markets like gas stations, which is true. So there are a lot of private gas stations, there are virtually none left in China. Um, so yeah, they're all at, you know, the big Sinopec and CNPC yeah, stations. Yeah. Well, it's, it's so it happened in the U.S. a long time ago. Yeah, yeah, we had, <laughs> it just was not yeah, it was Rockefeller, yeah. I mean, but you know, I mean, you, you, are, you are at the right mm. time and place. I mean, it seems to me that we're observing a, a huge historical process here yes. that is changing the world, that will certainly mm. change the world when it, when it, when it realizes its, uh, its future. And you're in a great place mm. you know, to be a political economist, to know about China. They're fantastic. I hope you wake up every morning, Chris, and say, thank you, you know, for a great <laughs> being, you know, positioning me in this great, wonderful place, ac academically and intellectually. <laughs> anyway, so we take a short break. On that note, <laughs> that's Chris McNally, Associate Professor of uh, Political Economy at Chaminade, Adjunct Senior Fellow at the East West Center. We're talking about the great rebalance. And when we come back, we're still going to ask him exactly what is it. <laughs> We'll be right back. We want to thank our underwriters. Hawaiian Electric Company and its affiliates Maui Electric on Maui and Hawaii Electric Light Company on Hawaii Island are deeply committed to the communities they serve. Galen Ho is a senior executive of BAE Systems, a global defense, security, and aerospace company. The High Tech Development Corporation, the state's leading technology agency, attached to the Department of Business, Economic Development, and Tourism. Castle and Cook Hawaii, with a time-honored legacy that spans more than 160 years and revolves around its mission of investing in Hawaii, creating communities, and providing for the needs of our state. Hawaii Gas, formerly the gas company, a proponent of the liquefied natural gas initiative, 
helping Hawaii achieve its transition to clean energy and a better energy future. Collateral Analytics, a Hawaii-based tech company empowering the real estate industry with greater and faster access to the tools and data they need to make better informed property investment decisions. I'm Nicole Horry. Thanks so much for joining us on ThinkTech. I'm Maria Kashem. See you next time. Okay, we're back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech Asia in Review. And uh, that's Chris McNally, Associate Professor of Political Economy at Chaminade and Adjunct Senior Fellow at the East West Center. And boy, you, know, you really wish you could hear our discussion during the break, but you can't. <laughs> it's too good. <laughs> we're talking about the great rebalance today of China in the world. And uh, I guess I would, I would put the question to him, the, the, the sort of the title question, what is it? What is the Great Rebalance? Good question. <laughs> uh, basically, the way it's mostly perceived is to move away from a model of economic growth based upon increasing exports and increasing investment to a model that keeps investment flowing but really increases consumption and exports become a less important part of the economy, imports become a more important part, so it kind of means also balancing China's trade. It means diffusing to some extent the trade deficit with the United States and, and some of the economic problems there. Uh, but it really means, and that's the way the Chinese government is, this is the interpretation that is emerging now, that to pull this off, it means continued investment in high-speed rail, in urbanization, in social welfare services, meaning hospitals, parks, kindergartens, schooling, uh, sewage plants, uh, you know, a whole host of environmental issues. And with that, pulling people into urban areas, about, two, as I said, 200 to 300 million people in the next decade, using that as a new motor for economic development, and ultimately then making China increasingly independent of its reliance on export markets like the European Union Anything and the US. Foreign. So uh, relatively speaking, it becomes more economically powerful in the world. Yes. Uh, so <clears throat> you know, I, I, I keep thinking of this old term, maybe you know the Chinese for it, it's stand up China. Mm -hmm. It's this whole notion um, of we are no longer uh, under anybody's heel. N none of that early 19th century, uh, 20th century, um, you know, imperialism in our in our country by Western powers. Um, we can do it by ourselves. We'll do it better by ourselves. Stand up, China, and uh, throwing the yoke of any Western imperialism or the remainder of any yoke of Western. Imperialism. But <clears throat> it seems to me that what, from what you say, there's another element, and that is, when you do all this, you become more economically influential in the world because you hold paper, because you have trade arrangements that that are beneficial, because you can use. You know, essentially, blockage control on, on 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 making deals work better for you. Uh, that you get to be more powerful. And I thought you meant when you when you provided this name for this show that there was a rebalancing going on between China and the rest of the world. And, and at the end of the rebalancing, China would be, you know, maybe more than the second economy. It might be the first economy, and that was the rebalancing. Isn't that part of it somehow by indirection anyway? Yeah, I mean, the, the idea about stand up China, by the way, was Mao. So that was very much his, and his economic policies really didn't drive China that much further. So uh, China really has kind of integrated into the global capitalist system for the you know, last 30 plus years and has been enormously successful. They stand at a very critical juncture. There, there are huge problems because there's an overhead, overhang of bad debts. Uh, there is a possibility of a financial crisis. I personally don't think it's going to happen because the government basically controls the financial system. So it would basically mean the government has to cough up money to kind of bail out the banks uh, and the local governments, which are the culprits in this system. Uh, there's industrial overcapacity. Uh, there are huge income inequalities in the system. Uh, and there continue to be a lot of uh, you know, vested interests that don't want the system to change, including the big state banks that are enormously powerful. And they love it. You know, the government sets a ceiling on interest rates for deposits. Uh, now it's freed, actually, the ceiling for lending. Uh, but most, uh, you know, it's above where the threshold is. So they have this kind of guaranteed profit machine, you know, which is very nice for them. So there's a lot of inherent opposition to what they need to do. And in what, the country. In the country itself. Uh, but if they pull it off, uh, 
a side effect almost, because I think for the Communist Party, the main issue is keeping themselves in power. Sure. And, and the people who keep them in power are not the United States or Russia or it's Europe, the people it's China. the people in China. Yeah. Uh, so those are the people that count. Those are the people that will have to be satisfied. Those are the people who cannot be basically steamrolled too much into what is quite a different economic system. Now there's going to be lots of beneficiaries, but the beneficiaries are the farmers. They they don't really know it. You know, they they're not really aware of you know that they could benefit. And in many cases, they move to the cities and are without jobs, and that creates a whole host of new problems. Yeah. So there's a there's a, a lot of I would say dangers. Uh, this is a tight rope they need to walk. But let's say they're successful. Let's say they continue to grow at somewhere between five and seven percent for the next seven eight years. And they have uh, some nice inflation, meaning you know the two to three percent range inflation, which is good because that will gradually also make those bad debts smaller. It's what we're doing in the United States. It's optimistic inflation, yeah. Yeah, optimistic inflation, exactly. You don't want too little, you don't want too much. Uh, then yes, by about 2020, roughly, China will be uh, an economy that is almost as large as the United States but will be dynamically much more important because it still would be growing. If China is almost as large as the United States and grows at 5% and we're growing at 2.5%, 3%. No big deal. Yeah, there, there's a big difference. You know, there's, uh, there, um, I mean, China will, by that point, already be more important in globally systemic terms than the United States. Well, in, in, the, in the metric of it, uh, you mentioned in one of the breaks that, uh, let's see, um, China is now at 8, eight um, yeah, roughly 8.4, 8.5 trillion US dollars GDP. And That's Japan exchange is, uh, rates. Five trillion. Five something, yeah. Uh, and the US is at 16, did you say? Almost 16, I almost think, right? Just around trillion. 16, yeah. So China has a long way to go to catch up with us. Yeah. Um, so but it actually goes very fast because if you have, you need to take into account inflation differentials and they have slightly higher inflation than we do and exchange rate appreciation. That's the big unknown. Uh, because one of, to come in a sense, a crux of the problem that the Chinese are addressing, this whole rebalancing, the, the creation of a consumption class, also involves financial reforms, freeing interest rates, having a more market a more driven financial system. This does not mean that they'll let it just go and liberalize fully. This will be a system that will be heavily regulated, but to have it more market oriented. And with that, ultimately, to build healthier domestic financial institutions and financial markets and moving in the direction of internationalizing their currency. Mm -hmm. Because China's biggest dependence at present is not so much on, on the US uh, for buying Chinese goods, although that's still very important, uh, but really on the US for parking China's savings. Yeah. And they're very dependent on the US dollar in the international financial system. And since 2008, when trade financing basically froze and the United States embarked on quantitative easing, they become very concerned that their US dollars might not be worth that much 10, 20 years down the road. So the idea is really to take their own currency, the yuan or renminbi, and internationalize it. And that they started doing that, what, two or three years ago. Yes. They made this, instead of uh, pegging it to the dollar or gold, I forget which, uh, they pegged it to a basket of currencies, and that changed everything. They had it pegged to the dollar, uh, and in 2005, uh, already eight years ago, oh, gee, they, time flies. they started what is what I will call a managed depreciation. Yeah. So the reference point is still the US dollar, because yeah. you can look at it against the euro or the yen, and, and there's no big correlation. Uh, and um, the idea was to gradually manage an appreciation of the currency to keep domestic inflation at bay, to keep speculative capital flows at bay, and to create incentives for Chinese manufacturers to move up the value added ladder. In retrospect, so, was it a good idea? Did it work the way they intended? Is it, it part of this so far. Uh, you know, uh, monetiza international monetization program they're on now? No, I mean, it's, it's, it was something they totally did uh, themselves and really hasn't much to do with an international program. But what they're doing for about two, three years is internationalizing the currency, meaning right. allowing foreigners, you know, getting access to it. And so far, it's been going quite slowly. You know, there's been lots of little baby steps made. And everybody agrees that for the UN to really play a meaningful international role, you need to have some opening of the capital account, meaning you need to have free flows of capital into and out of the country, uh, probably 
you know, they, they'll have some controls, I'm sure about that, because they distrust markets, they don't want big speculative inflows, but they, you need more openness, so that foreigners who have been accumulating yen, yen have been accumulating offshore, in London and in Hong Kong, in Nigeria, and in Brazil, and people need somewhere to put that money. They don't just want to park it in the bank and get no returns, they want to be able to invest in bonds or in stocks, and that is not possible at present. So there's still a, a big problem of how to manage this transition. But if they're successful uh, in these next, as I said, five to seven years, this is the crucial time frame. By 2020, the yen is quite likely then to emerge as somewhat of an internationalized currency. And that changes, again, the role of the dollar and ultimately could make the United States not just the prime economic power, but uh, the major economic power besides another or if you take the European Union besides another yeah. two. And that will change a lot of how the United States can act within the international economic and financial yeah. system. Uh, well, I'd like to spend the last part of our show discussing yeah. the possibilities there. Yeah. Uh, that's a really interesting thing. And, I, and when you said the great rebalance, uh, I see that also as a great you know, political rebalance, if you will, of the way of the power structure of the world today is going to change. As the economy, you know, as the economics change, so does everything else. We'll be right back after this break. That's uh, Chris McNally, associate professor of political economy at Chaminade and adjunct senior fellow at the East West Center. We're talking about the great rebalance of China. This is Think Tech Asia in Review. We'll be right back. Hi, I'm Donna Blanchard of Kumu Kuhue Theater. And when I was young, I used to love watching Charlie Chan movies on Family Classic TV on Sunday afternoons. Our show at Kumukuhua that runs from August 22nd through September 22nd is called Will the Real Charlie, Charlie Chan Please Stand Up? It's written by Nancy P. Moss and takes place right here in Chinatown. I really hope you'll come in and watch it. You will love it. It's everything about the movies that you loved and more. Go to kumukuhua.org to get more information and your tickets. We'll see you there. Okay, we're back, we're live, we're at Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. We're doing Agent Review this afternoon with Chris McNally, Associate Professor of Political Economy at Chaminade and Adjunct Senior Fellow with the East West Center. And I know him for at least 10 years. And my admiration only grows. Thanks for coming down, Chris. Thanks, Jay. <laughs> Thanks. So as the economy of China grows, and it is growing in so many ways, I mean, you know, call it uh, management, call it luck or pluck or whatever, it is growing and it will grow and one of these days it's going to approach and probably at some at some point surpass the US there's a fair chance of that in our lifetimes we should hmm. live so long um, how does that change the the political uh, you know the, the relative political power of the major countries in the world it's got to have a change effect don't you think it will for sure again it, there there is a major if uh, because as I said China is at this crucial juncture in its history. It could go the other way. There's been a lot of talk about a possible financial crisis or just much lower growth rates that could create social instability with that political instability and who knows where China will go then. Well, it's like, you know, there's such a huge connection between China and the U.S. now by the paper, by the trade, uh, whatever it is, that if it does go the wrong way, if it does fold in on itself somehow, we will suffer. Don't you oh, yes. Yeah. Well, the whole world will probably go into a depression. Yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah. I mean, if you had a real, what, what I'm talking about is not just slowing Chinese growth. I mean, we're talking about a real political crisis, upheaval, where growth basically goes zero or even into negative the, the, realm. The, the footnote on that is that we should not wish them ill. No. We should, not, no. We should wish them well, because no. they, like it or not, mm. they're our partners in, in the global economy. We can sure. not well, reject that. Well, we are very deeply intertwined. I mean, we're so deeply intertwined. This has really never occurred before in world history. Although Germany and Great Britain were quite deeply intertwined before the First World War, it, it still is in terms of magnitude and, and depth sli slightly different, uh, especially on the financial side. You know how much of our assets the, the Chinese own, and you know how much we trade with the Chinese. How much of our goods, uh, you know, are sourced from China. 
how much American companies like Walmart and, and KFC and McDonald's and Coca-Cola and General Motors and General Electric are involved in the Chinese market. So this is really kind of uh, new, historically speaking. And so I would argue that once we get to 2020, and let's, uh, let's just put this if out of the way. Let's say China has a good 60-70% chance of succeeding with a 5-7% to growth rate. Uh, an appreciating currency, keeping inflation in check, and rebalancing to a consumption-driven society, then by 2020 and 2021, uh, some of the biggest differences will happen regionally, where uh, a lot of the countries at China's doorstep, although unhappy about China becoming so powerful, both economically and politically, will be trading so deeply with China, and increasingly being so dependent on Chinese tourists and Chinese investment that you know, we'll go back to a system that is not a tributary system, but a system where you know, countries will have uh, much more constrained room of geopolitical maneuver because of their geoeconomic dependence. Inherent in there somewhere, isn't, isn't inherent in there somewhere the notion of competition? You know, I mean, if you were to look at the, the essence of the Chinese thing, wouldn't you find them competing with us? And wouldn't you find us competing with them or not wanting them to compete better than we compete? Yes. Uh, yeah. and, so and for the Chinese, the United States, much more than for the US, is kind of the counterpoint. I mean, the Chinese might compare themselves in terms of fashion to Milano and Paris, but in terms of a country, in terms of a global power, the only point of reference is the United States. Yeah. yeah. So now my, my last question of you. Mm. Not a small question. <laughs> is recognizing all of this, recognizing, you know, what what is happening there, yeah. uh, the rebalancing, the international rebalancing that will follow from the domestic rebalancing, mm -hmm. recognizing, you know, the the, the, um, the the interrelationship of the two economies for sure, undeniable. What do we do? What does the U.S. do to come out ahead, or at least not to lose ground? on this competition, if you will? In many ways, be ourselves. Be the United States uh, that we were when we grew, when we developed. Uh, I'm talking about, to some extent, 19th century United States, when we were the breadbasket of the world, which we will become inevitably again, together with Brazil. Because people Europe. need us. <laughs> people need food. Food prices have been going up. If it weren't for the United States, we'd be in much more dire straits. Uh, we will become increasingly energy independent. Uh, question sometimes is when and how, but there's no doubt that we will become much more of a resource exporter than importer. Uh, and in many ways, we have land. Uh, so as a place of emigration for Chinese, also for many people uh, from India, etc., the United States will remain enormously attractive. And we probably will get a situation, for example, that is happening uh, in biochemistry and pharmaceutical development, where it's actually Chinese pharmaceutical companies that are outsourcing their R&D to the United States, because that's what we do a lot better. Uh, I think it'll stay that way because there's a lot of smart people in China who went to school in the U.S. But there's going to be continuing a lot of smart people from China who will come to the United States, and they are coming earlier and earlier. They'll go to high school for the last two years, and then they'll go as an undergraduate, and then they'll do a degree, and then they still will be able to speak Chinese, and they still will have relatives back in China, but it's very likely that they probably prefer to stay in the United States. Which, which helps us. Which, which is, helps is, us. It, it, we ought to incentivize that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so a lot of that is going to go on, I, I, and in, I think for the United States, the biggest transition we, in some sense, be geopolitically. Uh, that we're not going to be just the ultimate most powerful country on the globe that calls the shots in every single corner. Uh, we might have to at some point think more about ourselves as a Western Hemispheric power uh, and you know, think about Eurasia as kind of an outside balancer, really trying to balance the interests of all these big powers, not just the Chinese, but also the Indians and increasingly Southeast Asia. And the role that we can play there will probably have to be fine-tuned over time. Uh, so 
But uh, the biggest threat, I would argue, for the United States is in terms of, of currency, because we have an exorbitant privilege in terms of the dollar. Uh, some economists would argue this could be good, uh, because if the dollar competes with one or two other world currencies, we have to basically manage our affairs a lot better. Exorbitant Put privilege means it's, over, it's uh, overvalued. Yes, it's overvalued. So there's probably undoubtedly going to be some drop in the dollar, but that's not necessarily so bad. It will make our exports much more competitive. If it doesn't happen rapidly, that is part of this rebalance, that the Chinese currency goes up and the dollar comes down. Uh, but even more importantly, it will mean that we'll probably have to pay higher interest rates within our country, uh, So, which could have... Uh, you know, on highly leveraged businesses and also on the real estate sector, uh, you know, a negative influence for some time. It, 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 not necessarily very long, but there could be a transitionary period where all of a sudden the dollar is not as liked as much. Probably in the late 2020s, I would suspect that, that it might be earlier, but it could be also later. And then at that point, the United States will basically have to get its own economic house in order uh, to be very attractive to investors. And that means higher interest rates, basically. What, what I see when I, when I get out of your, of your thought, maybe right or wrong, you can agree or disagree, is, is uh, we have to change our way of looking at China. We're, we're going to be, if we're not already, in a global partnership with China. We're going we're to have to share power more than before. We have to share economic prowess more than before. Mm -hmm. And we're going to have to fashion a relationship that will carry us through with, you know, both countries, uh, uh, you know, win-win uh, relationship. But that's not easy. There are all kinds of political implications to that, diplomatic implications, but it's certainly possible. And it's a, it's a whole big shift in the world, in humanity. And it's happening around us right now. Yes. Yes, it is. And um, as you said, it, it's going to be not easy for both sides. It's going to be very difficult. And in many areas where the United States would like the Chinese to take more responsibility and more leadership, they will not be willing to do so. And yet in other areas like these islands, uh, they'll probably continue to be very, very tough. And that could create big problems down the road. So this, this could be a very conflictual relationship if not managed well. And so I agree with you that uh, kind of a more conscious effort at managing this relationship across all levels, uh, across all aspects, uh, will be key for the next decade. Could be the best of times, maybe not. <laughs> maybe not. It certainly will be a period of uncertainty, as I sometimes tell my students. We're entering the age of uncertainty. That's all I can say. <laughs> that's all he can say. That's, that's Chris McNally, <laughs> Associate Professor of uh, Political Economy at Chaminade, Adjunct uh, Senior Fellow at the East-West Center, talking about China, the Great Rebalance. It's been a great discussion. Thank you very much, Chris. Thank you, Jay. Aloha. Pleasure. We'll be back um, tomorrow with much more Think Tank. Aloha. Aloha. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech Hawaii, broadcasting live from the Pioneer Plaza in downtown Honolulu. We raise public awareness about tech, energy, and globalism in Hawaii. Technology is critical to our state. A vibrant tech sector will give us new prospects in the global marketplace and will offer great careers and make our economy more resilient. Streaming live on Ustream and Spreaker, ThinkTech allows its hosts and guests invaluable opportunities to report important events and discuss important questions, and to be heard here in Hawaii and around the world. You can find links to our live streams on thinktechhawaii.com or on our mobile website, m.thinktechhawaii.com. And you can see our archive on YouTube. It's all just a click away. We want to do whatever we can to keep Hawaii relevant, connected, and thriving in the complexity of the 21st century. We hope you will help us in those efforts. Tune in today. This is ThinkTech. I'm Jay Fidel. Mahalo.